Oh, I've lived in Fresno since 1958 when my husband and I moved here and we uh, brought up our two children here, who of course are adults and no longer live here. Um, but my story for you actually begins on November 9th, 1938, on the night known as Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, which um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, where Nazis went all over Germany, burning synagogues, smashing windows and glass, known as the night of broken glass, of uh, stores owned by Jews, uh, beating Jews and going into homes, and which is what happened at my home when I was a 15 month old, um, living with my parents in Augsburg, Germany, which is a city um, just north um, west of uh, Munich in Southern Germany, it's uh, Augsburg. And uh, the Nazis um, came into our home too. They bang on the doors, come in, they go through the house looking for uh, valuables and money and at that time, my parents had some guests in the house where they had a lesson on photography given by someone, something they were interested in. And uh, so there were more men there and they were arrested by the Nazis and taken to Dachau, the first, one of the first concentration camps established by the Nazis, um, you know, during that time. And um, we never really had a lot of information from my father from Dachau. I do have a postcard, which is one of the most valuable little documents. Can I show that? Let's see how does yes, it show? Yes, you can. With the original if Dachau you... stamp, which is actually a little bit uh, loose here. It's a regular stamp. And it's the postcard written to my mother from Dachau saying everything is fine here. Of course, they check it all. And on this side are all kinds of instructions about what kind of cards to write or letters once a month and that kind of thing. So this is from my father. Um, before my father was taken, before Kristallnacht, he went to New York City to speak to some family we had there, some cousins, talking to them about sponsoring us to leave Germany and come to New York. They agreed to this. They were not people of wealth, uh, but it was good of them. We're very appreciative that they did this. And uh, they agreed to do this. So the papers were being processed through the New York, or I'm sure German government. And so after my father was arrested and taken to Dachau, the next day my mother said she went to Munich and stood online all day with these papers to show them that we were being accepted in New York uh, as emigrants. Um, during a few years during the Holocaust, there was a period of time where the Nazis were allowing Jews to leave Germany if they had papers to go someplace. Uh, all the countries were very strict about coming, entering, or Germany was strict about leaving. You had to have exit papers. And entry papers, my mother had some of the proper papers. So at that time, they agreed to uh, let my father out. And so after about three months, they did, which was fortunate in terms of the time that too many Jews had to spend in concentration camp under horrific conditions. Um, I also have, uh, let's see, what else did I have here? a picture during that time um, when we were allowed to leave, of course, which was the big question that so many Jews had, where will we go? Because they had to be sponsored. And uh, our papers to leave Germany were not ready yet, um, or to get, come into the United States, I should say, were not uh, ready yet, but we, they gave us permission to leave. And of course we wanted to leave as soon as possible. But an interesting thing happened uh, at that time on Kristallnacht, my grandparents, uh, my grandmother and grandfather went to Baden-Baden, which is a small town in Germany with the baths. The Germans love to go for the cure for the baths for a little vacation. And during that time, my grandfather was also arrested in Baden-Baden. And um, here's also a picture where they, let's see, 
where they arrested yeah, yeah. him and they made them march down the street holding a, a, a large Mogan Dovid here. My grandfather is this gentleman at the head of the line and they had to march down. They were taunted and then they were released, which was fortunate. But the important it's thing- It's a is, Star of David. Star Mogan of David. David. Mogan Dovid, I'm yeah, sorry, yeah. big Star of David, obviously indicating- yeah. But during that time, an interesting thing happened that he met a couple from Manchester, England, who saw what was going on. And the couple said, if you have to get out of Germany and you have no place to go, you can come and live with us in Manchester, which is amazing and wonderful that people would do such things. So of course, my grandmother and grandfather, went after he was released, went right back to Augsburg they did not have exit papers, so were not able to leave. Eventually, they did get out, but they couldn't leave at that time. But after my father got out of um, three months later, was released from Dachau, my mother, father, and I, we packed everything up into something called a lift, which we never got. It was probably stolen. But um, anyway, we left and went to Manchester, England to live with these people for... Uh, eight months until we had our papers to enter New York City. And um, they were lovely people. They had a little girl a couple of years older than I was. And my mother said she was teaching me English words so that I could, and teaching them so that we could speak English when we came to America. Um, the name of the pe people were the Jacksons. My mother kept up with them for a little while, but then we lost, we lost contact. Um, I have a picture here of, I don't know if anyone's into the, the synagogue that my parents attended in Augsburg, which was burned. Oh, wow. But rebuilt um, by the uh, uh, Augsburg uh, government and donations. I know I visited that, and now it's more of a museum than, uh, than anything. And um, this is the home. That, I, that my parents lived in. My parents lived on one floor, my parents and I, and my grandparents lived, which was typical at the time where uh, different generations lived in one. So this is in Augsburg, the home where I lived. And so eventually we set sail for the United States. I have the uh, ship uh, manifest with our names on it. And I have a picture of the um, SS Georgic that we sailed on. Wow. To America. And then my favorite picture is the one here of my mother, father, and I exiting the ship. And my father is pointing to the new world and our new life and our safe life in America. And I was about two and a half at the time my mother's holding me. That's amazing. Another little uh, factor that I think is interesting is, um, which isn't known that much, is um, the uh, our uh, passports. This is my mother's passport, and then mine is. Then I, I'm on here as a little addition down on this side, <laughs> and this is my mother's right here. But her name is Paula Pauline. And her name, middle name is Sarah. My middle name is Hannah Sarah Jacobson. Sarah was the name given to every Jewish child by the Nazis that was born at that time to identify them. And every man born at that time was given the name Israel. Uh, so this again was an identification tool besides of course the gold uh, star that everybody had to wear on their clothing. Um, let's see, then I just have a family picture of uh, some family, let's see, three, uh, four of these people, this is some of the um, grandparents were sent to Theresienstadt, which was a camp, a lot of older people, and four of them in this picture died in uh, yeah. Kerosene or Theresienstadt at the time. Which is outside of Prague. Yes, yeah, yeah. And um, we did vi uh, visit that also over the years, my husband and I. 
So that's my story. So technically, and this is something that uh, I know Hillary, I am personally not considered a, uh, a survivor, although, you know, in many ways I am. Uh, my father probably, who obviously was, uh, had been in camp, uh, is a survivor, but um, that's uh, something, Hillary, that I know my husband used to say, you're only a survivor if you were in the camps, but uh, I'm not uh, no, sure. No, you, um, Bill, can, there we are. Hi. Bill is from Fresno joining us. Um, so you would be, con you are considered a child survivor. And, and un unfortunately, most of the survivors that are still with us are child survivors because of their ages. And so um, I think, you know, I've seen survivors who have spoken all the way into their early 90s, but um, most, of, most of the survivors now that we have who speak to us are um, in their in their mid eighties around, oh, you know, 85. So, yeah. And so, um, so, um, I have some questions, but why don't we open it up to some questions, Bill, you kind of missed the beginning of Hannah's talk, but, um, that's okay. We will, um, we, I'm sure you guys have questions and I know Hannah, um, would love to answer them. So. Anybody want to start? They recorded this bill, so I don't know if you can pick it up if you yeah so inclined. Yeah, thank you for, for letting me know that. Yeah. I have a question. Um, just considering how young you were at the time, um, how did your parents kind of talk to you about the story uh, of what had happened? Um, what age did they finally did they feel? comfortable bringing it to you or how did they broach it with you when you were when you were a child rather late in life and I think everybody will tell you that that the people didn't talk about it my mother's talked about it a little bit more and my father was very stoic and and didn't talk a lot about it uh and unfortunately my mother who was probably more verbal but she had a lot of health problems and emotional problems which I think stemmed from her experiences and they had a hard time coming into New York. I grew up in the Heights, which you probably all know about, which at the time was more of an Irish, um, Jewish, Greek, um, middle um, working class neighborhood. And uh, life was not, not easy for them. But I grew up in, I would say, a loving household. And, you know, I, I was really kind of, I look back, I was probably oblivious to their particular issues other than the fact of my mother's health which was an issue and and they really didn't talk a lot about it my mother spoke more about it in later years when i was really more of an adult did you um go to synagogue growing up or were your parents a involved bit. in synagogue Not really. and even they went, uh, you know, somewhat, but not a lot. They were more reformed Jews. And uh, I went to religious school some in New York City. And I used to go to some services with friends when we would go, but uh, we were not uh, regular temple observers. Were they when you were in Germany? Some, but I, I really, can't say that there's, I know there were members of this synagogue that I showed you a photo of. Yeah. But um, I don't know, I don't think they went a lot. Interesting. So I think that so many of the families back then were more Orthodox when they were living in Europe. And more then, Eastern Europe, I think. They were. Yeah, maybe more Eastern Europe. German Jews were not as Orthodox. I know my husband's family were from Berlin. And um, they <laughs> they did they belonged to a large synagogue there too and were supportive, but they didn't attend a lot. Mm -hmm. I was. Interesting. I, I have so many questions. Other people have questions. 
I do. Do you have any siblings that were born after you left? Hannah, can you be a little closer to the um, computer where it's a little I sure weird? Yeah, okay. Thank you so yeah. much. Maybe this will help. Mm -hmm. So you said that you're, they didn't talk to you about it until a little bit later. I've heard from other survivors that um, the family stayed close to uh, or had close relationships with other survivors um, and kind of had a community of member, you know, uh, that they would get to get together with that were survivors also. That's, that's true. As I say, other families that were uh, Jews from uh, Germany and some of the surrounding areas were pretty much the focus of the social group that my parents uh, were with. My husband's story that I mentioned just very briefly um, are from Berlin and his, John's father, my husband's no longer alive, um, but his father was a dentist in Berlin. And um, he also was a Zionist. So I don't know if any familiar, he was a supporter of establishing the state of Israel for Jews. So he was interested in that. And again, people didn't quite know what to do or where to go if they were looking around and seeing the handwriting on the wall. Well, John's father saw the handwriting on the wall very early. And as soon as Hitler was elected in 1933 and duly elected, as you all know, uh, John's father said, we're getting out of here. And he took his wife and two sons and the family thought they were crazy. Uh, and he, well, they, they emigrated to Palestine, which was easier to do in 1933. They wanted people to come there and to help to build, build the state. Mm -hmm. Interesting. It, it sounds like, and you showed us the picture of the family that you lost in Theresienstadt, then do, was there more of your relatives than that? Um, were murdered in the Holocaust as well, or did a some fair amount John, of them some, get out? Uh, no, some, we didn't have a large family. Some, uh, some got out earlier, especially the ones who uh, were the, the sponsors. There was a, a group of cousins who had gotten out earlier, um, mm -hmm. two families, and they were the, fortunately the ones who did sponsor us. Um, there weren't as many uh, as we, uh, there were some cousins who were still lost who were killed in either Theresien Stutter mm -hmm. and some of the camps. I was not a, uh, aware of anyone who was in Auschwitz, uh, which of course is one of the largest uh, camps there. Yeah. So did you, have you been back to Germany and how, what was that like if you went? It was interesting. Some of the um, cities who made contact, who found some of their, found out about some of their early uh, residents um, periodically invited the people back for uh, four or five days and welcomed them and showed them around town and were very gracious. And John and I, first we resisted and then we did take advantage of that and we went back, we were in Augsburg. Uh, John did not do it in uh, Berlin, although I think his brother did in Berlin did that. Um, this was fairly common among many of the cities, but we did, uh, visit Berlin, uh, visit, well, we visited Berlin on a couple of occasions, but we also were in Germany, we're in Augsburg, and we were welcomed at City Hall. This was a group of about 10 um, former residents who had to leave, who were still around, and uh, we were welcomed and taken to a play and to a concert and shown around the city and very nicely treated to uh, and welcomed. Uh, back and that's when we visited the synagogue and the um, the museum, which is a small museum, which is now in that synagogue. Did and you go back to, to, to? And when we also visited Berlin, interesting in Berlin, we went to um, <clears throat> the neighborhood where John grew up, where my husband grew up, and uh, it was a large multi-story building that his parents lived in. And uh, all the homes, all the buildings around you could see were new, had obviously been bombed out, but the building he had lived in, you could see was fixed up. It wasn't in bad shape. 
but it was still the original, the original building that he had uh, lived in. Wow. Which obviously survived. That's amazing. Um, did you go to Dachau? Uh, yes, we went to Dachau. We did go to Dachau. We went to quite a few. We went to, to Terezin. And uh, what is the other one in Poland? No, I've forgotten where we went. Um, we did to not Trebilinka? go. Some of them uh -oh. have been really cleaned up a lot and mm -hmm. you know, ties, but this one, oh no, I've forgotten the name of it. I'm sorry. Where we went to in Poland, we visited, it was really not cleaned up. And I remember we went, we was during the winter we had visited once. I had some uncles during the time people were leaving my father's twin brothers who went with their mother to Johannesburg they knew somebody there and they emigrated to Johannesburg and lived there um, for many many years and in the 70s went back to um, Munich and lived in Munich uh, things were not great in Johannesburg they felt at the time and uh, they felt safer in Munich and did go back to Munich and lived there. Uh, we visited them. Interesting. Interesting. Do you have a question, Bill? Okay. Anybody else have a question? Another? Charlie? Yes. Um, and how you share this history too with your own families into future generations and kind of keeping, you, you're sharing it with us, but I'm curious uh, about how, I, I don't know if you have if children or grandchildren or, um, how you're passing this down. I do, I do uh, pass this down. I do share it with them. And I told them about this event. And I had uh, the, the pictures I, sh I showed you, I had a little exhibit at our, um, there's another friend here, Eva Maiden, you know her, Hillary in Fresno. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She's yeah. written a book actually about her experience. She was a little older than I was from, v uh, from Vienna. And um, she had, experiences similar to mine. They went to Switzerland for a while and then to the United States. Um, but she had an exhibit in one of the libraries, the um, Woodward Library, of some of things that she had letters. And um, then the next year I was asked to make put a little exhibit together, which I did with some of these artifacts I showed you at the downtown main library, which is one way, I guess, that you know, we share some of these um, experiences. So they have, when you walk into the library, there are some windows on either side, which they uh, place exhibits in for holidays and, and uh, different events. And so one of those windows I had for a month, uh, six weeks or so, I had these things up and I had made up cards uh, with, uh, you know, the story and the printing on it, which were in the exhibit, mm -hmm. along with the photos I showed you. But I do share with my children and grandchildren as much as I can. A couple of the grandchildren have been to um, back to Germany and visited some of the sites I've talked about, two of them out of the five, actually. Um. <clears throat> wow. Did you grow up speaking German or Yiddish or did your parents say no, no, you're German. learning English? No, they spoke German and I learned German from them. My grandparents, fortunately, especially originally, eventually came over um, to my mother's parents, uh, came over uh, to New York also. And I think they spoke German together, but my mother said, I never wanted to speak German because I wanted to be an American, she said. So I spoke, mm -hmm. but I do speak some German, pretty basic. And um, uh I must have just picked it up from, you know, their conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I know Hannah knows my father very well, and um, they're close to the same age. And since I've been doing this so much and teaching so much about the Holocaust, my father and I were talking, this is just very recently. And he said, oh, I used to speak Yiddish with grandma all the time. And I said, Grandma spoke Yiddish? I don't remember. He said that was her first language. She only spoke Yiddish. And I could only speak to her in Yiddish. That was the way. And I said, do you know any Yiddish now, Dad? And he was like, I know no Yiddish at all. So, but I can still 
speak a little German, keep, keep up a yeah. basic conversation. Mm -hmm. Where was where was he, was he from? Where were his family from? Eastern Europe? Bialystok, Poland. Poland. And See, they, they were all yeah. good speaking uh, there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, he was obviously born in Los Angeles, but um, but his mom and my great grandparents all spoke Yiddish. So, yeah. But when the older folks came over, my grandparents, too, see, they didn't speak uh, English anymore either. Mm -hmm. um, so when, how long were you in um, New York for and then what happened after that? Okay, I think you have to move closer to your computer. It's yeah, I was in New York until 1956 when I met my husband. I grew up, I had been at Hunter College for a year and uh, John was in San Francisco. He had emigrated again, as I said, he grew up in, um, in Tel Aviv, he and his brother. His father was a dentist in continued his dental practice, which was very difficult. Nobody had any money in Israel to pay a dentist, but somehow they survived. And, um, but they wanted them to go, the parents thought they'd get a good education going to uh, the United States. And so my husband and his brother went to Berkeley, Cal, and uh, he went to Cal and came, then after Cal, he worked in Fresno for a short period of time was drafted into the um, Korean War, but was in Germany during that time, and then went to law school after that. He was in his second year in law school, visited his parents in New York, who had emigrated for a second time. Very difficult for people to do that. I just never understood how they could, you know, first to Israel from Germany, and then another time. They were sort of disillusioned in Israel and with life in Israel and, and decided to, to come to the United States. So they came to New York. My husband was, John was visiting them in New York when we met at the time. And so it was a very fast romance. We were married and I went back to, went to San Francisco because he had a fin he was finishing law school. He didn't like New York anyway and wasn't gonna live in New York. And um, it was a harder time in New York uh, at that time in the fifties and sixties. So. Anyway, I, I went to San Francisco and uh, we lived there. He finished law school. We lived there a short time and then moved to Fresno when he uh, uh, got a job here in a, uh, in a legal practice and uh, I practiced for over 30 years here in Fresno. Wow. And your children are all born and raised here. Yes, they are. But one, my yeah. daughter lives in, in Connecticut. And my son lives yeah. in uh, Marin County, Bay Area. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I know before that we let. Yeah, go ahead. Very young, and I understand that. But do you have any memories of crossing, or any memory, just any memory at all of it? You, I know. Just curious. Yeah, no, I don't know how, how many people have memories at two, two and a half. Every once in a while, somebody comes up with something and says, oh, I remember such and such when I was two. But I think that's pretty hard. It's rare. Mm -hmm. I think I think so also. But, uh, you know, maybe it's a smell that you remember or something that you yeah. can't figure out why or something like that. And then you attribute it to that. But um did your father talk about his time in Dachau with you ever? No, he didn't. I only remember one incident. We were at an event with a group of people. And I remember speaking to one gentleman. I can't tell you who he is. And I remember he, he was talking about Dachau and he said, he was telling me that my father was in a, in a bad state. And he said, I gave your father one of my last pieces of bread. I just remember him telling me that. And I said, well, wow. Very, very good of you. And, uh, mm -hmm. and my father came out, my mother only commented when she picked him up at the train station after he was released. And he'd been a fairly, well, he was, a, he was six foot and not heavy, but well, you know, put together. And she said she barely, she had a hard time just recognizing him when he came out. Even after three months, I guess, of starvation and labor, 
it takes mm. its toll. Well, and Dachau was one of the first camps for, it was the first time that they really rounded up people to put in Dachau, but it was also used for political dissidents and any person that Hitler did not want, whether they were disabled or Jehovah Witnesses, um, that was the first place that people people were sent was to Dachau. So it was a very diverse, if you, for lack of a better term, um, concentration camp. But of course, people um, were put in all, you know, from the groups that you mentioned were put in all the camps, really. Yes. Yeah, definitely. But as far as it being the first camp that was actually okay. used, with the exception of the first part of Auschwitz that was built, so Auschwitz one that was used to um, build bricks. Uh, so they, they, it was a, basically they sent, it was a labor camp and they sent people there to make brick, bricks. So, yeah. Well, many of the camps had different industries to mm -hmm. um, promote the German war action. Yes. <clears throat> Munition yeah. factories, they had the, uh, you know, the inmates working, um, inmates isn't the right yeah. word, but they had them working, making uh, munitions and clothing. I remember yeah. some of the books I've read, they made clothing for the inmates and um, mm -hmm. all kinds of them, which was probably better, yeah. Charlie? Um, okay. I'm curious about kind of just your own, when you were, your memories of being maybe in high school and learning the history of World War II. I know it would have been relatively recent history. Um, was the Holocaust taught or like, how was it taught, do you remember? kind of no I really don't yeah mm -hmm. good question you know I, I just don't New York City and George Washington High School public high school I don't remember how much of it we were taught probably minimally as they do in many of the schools well and at that time so you were in high school in what the middle 50s yeah, so wasn't that when communist was taking place uh, also, right? When the, the communists had, in, so I'm wondering, and the Nuremberg hearings were, I, I'm wondering if maybe that was more of a focus than when World War II. The Nuremberg trials, I think started in 48, 40, 47 or 48. I ha I'd have to look that up. I, dates are like the worst part of <laughs> teaching this for me. <laughs> I, so like, they started in 45, uh, 45, oh, 46, 45. I, okay. the end of the war, right? Right away. after. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had to, I had to go to Wikipedia, Hillary, just so you know, okay. it wasn't Good. there. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. The dates seem so, to come all together. They sometimes. do. They do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. Yes. Oh, um, something Hi, that, thank you, that I never heard in school. My, my grandparents were survivors. <laughs> Um, so at, in, in grandmother's Bible, when my aunts were born, grandfather was already, was, uh, in Auschwitz shortly after my aunts were born, but they had to stamp it with a, a seal to prove that it was a real birth. And it had the, the, uh, swastika on it. And I wondered if the, uh, official seal in your passport, if you had a stamp somewhere. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a swastika, and I think in my, um, let's see here, right here, you can, whoops, no. right here. Uh-huh, yeah. Oh, wow. That's the one that has the Hannah Sarah, and I have some other documents with the swastika, then there's one right here on the second page, they didn't, uh, let's see what else. That's amazing, Carrie. Just, another here's another big one thank you for sharing that yeah that was something i didn't know about until grandmother they showed her. at every every place augsburg that was october 25th 1938 um hmm. so if you had any real permission for anything you have the official seal on it absolutely and i'm trying wow. to think of my birth certificate if it had it i don't have that in front of me right now uh, what, it, it, are we allowed to say, ask what year you were born? 
Yeah, sure. 1937, as I say. Um, um, <clears throat> I, I, could, I could have done the math, but yeah. yeah. Okay. You got an actual wow. birth certificate? Uh, yeah, I have a, oh gosh, where's my book? I do have it. In my yes. aunt's cases, they were just all written in a family book and they added. Right, this is the family book. Uh, Interesting. Those in the family book here. Uh, family book. No, uh, this is, yeah, family birth book. Oh, uh, that's so interesting. You have that, Carrie, for your family? I don't, my cousin. Amelia in Stambul, which is a um, book of uh, birth. Let's see. And see, that does not have the swastika on it. Here's my father. See, this even has my father's. Uh, birth uh, on it. Uh, oh no, this is their mar marriage certificate. Uh, my my uh, parents' marriage certificate, which was wow. Uh, Thank you for sharing that. Then, then considered to be illegal later on because of the. the so that would have been early. Uh, mother's yeah. nineteen twelve. Wow. Oh, is there a swastika on there? No. No. 1912 was way too early. Too, what am I saying? Way too yeah. early. Yeah. yeah. And this yeah. is, what else? And this is, ah, here is Gebertschein, my father's. Oh, this is mine. Okay. And it does have, yeah, because it's, it's uh, 1937, and there's the swastika. Yep. Wow. So interesting. And so all your family documents in history were kept in the family book? Right. And I, I don't have my husband's book. But he has one too, which is, um, but his parents were older. So those pay, these pages are fairly fragile. I know his are even thinner. I have those in the safe. Um, mm. That's so interesting, Carrie. Thank you for bringing yeah. that to our yeah. attention. And Mm -hmm. for Hannah to be able to show that to us. That's uh, mm -hmm. absolutely amazing. I never knew that before today. So I really appreciate and this signature that up. Noggle, N-A-G-L-E, must have been some kind of an official there. His, his signature is on a lot of things. Hmm. Wow. Uh, any other questions before we continue on? And say thank you to Hannah for her time. Well, thank you for listening. And, uh, and I wish I had. I think everybody does wish that they had more information and spoke uh, to their families more and had questions after they're gone. Gee, I should have asked this and I should have asked that. Well, and in some cases, it just was so painful to for families to talk about and it just didn't end up happening but just the mere fact that you were there in germany on kristallnacht and i mean you have quite the story and you're and you're a survivor oh so, and we yeah, very much appreciate you right like i feel please don't take this the wrong way i do not mean to disagree with your husband but i do feel that you are a Holocaust survivor. Survivor, yeah, yeah. that's what I was. Yes, you are. You are a hundred percent. So, and anyway. fortunately, we do have a lot of stories that. Um, oh gosh, what's his name? Took the. Um, you know, they had stories. So many of the survivors have over the years given. Uh, oh, stories. at Shoah Foundation. Yeah, the Shoah Foundation. That's what we're doing next. We're going to talk about that. So, yeah. Anything else for Hannah before we let her go? Okay, my pleasure. Anytime you have any, obviously, any other questions, Hillary, you know where to find me. And I do, Hannah. Thank you everybody. so, so thank very you. much. Thank you to all of you, thank you. for your thank efforts you. to, you know, educate. Uh, I was just at the bank with my daughter. Um, 
and had to sign some papers so she could they could get into the safe. I thought they were on the note, but they're not. So I had to uh, sign some papers and he, I said I had to be home by, three, you know, 3.15. And he asked, and I said, I have to go online. And he asked me what I was doing, which I was surprised. Anyway, I told him what I was doing. And he said, oh, that's so good that people are being educated and so on, you know. Okay, <laughs> just the bank, the bank manager. Um, <laughs> but it's true well, because this is, we all know, this is a time where, uh People take exception to educating our students on issues that might uh, pain them, whether it's the Holocaust or the um, African uh, slavery issue or the indigenous American treatment and so many of these um, it problems and uh, backgrounds are coming more to the forefront now when we realize that you know, people are really don't understand them and don't know why, what happened then and what we have to do now to try to uh, make this a better world. And mm -hmm. education is the, is the key to it. So thank you to That's all of right. you who are promoting. Me, Hannah? Yeah. I, uh, something occurred to me because of course we've heard of many infants who didn't get out of there. So from, you were definitely a survivor. You might not have personally been in one of the camps, but you were a survivor. You lived. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And thank you for sharing with us. Well, and thank you for your educating. Okay. Yeah. Bye-bye. Have a good evening. Thank you, Hannah. I'll be in touch, Sam. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Phil. See you soon.